Oh, my screen seemed to be doing a little dance there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to welcome you to our Maestro's Musings. I'm Rosemary Thompson, and I have a wonderful guest, guest here with us today who will be performing with the orchestra next week, uh, Chris Dirksen. And before we get started, I do want to um, welcome you all today and let you know that the recording for this session will be up on the website in a couple of days if you want to revisit it or share it with friends. I want to begin by saying how privileged and honored we are at the Okanagan Symphony Orchestra to live, work, play, and make music on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Sioux people of the Okanagan. Um, they've been the stewards of this land for generations upon generations and will be again in the future. And we have such a respect for their vibrant culture and look forward to further collaborations. We're so grateful for the ones that we have been able to have so far. And we look forward to playing a meaningful part in changing um, the Canada for the better. So welcome. Uh, Chris is uh, saying eclectic, diverse, drawing on her background um, of a real mixed heritage with her father being from a long line of, of chiefs of the Cree nation and her mother being a long line of homesteaders of the Mennonite nation. Chris takes elements of both of these sides of her background and, and braids them together, um, adding new school electronics for a, a, a genre of music that I think is undefinable and ever changing and which is what makes it so exciting. And to have her perform with the Okanagan Symphony uh, will take us on that journey of, of undefinable as well. So we're all super excited to have Chris with us next week. Now, Chris is both a classically trained cellist as well um, and has such an incredible array of projects as a composer. She has Juno nominations. Um, she has a Dora Award. She has composed such things as Nappy and the Rocks, a symphonic story, which was commissioned by the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, where Chris is a resident artist. What is your official title there, Chris? I'm the artistic uh, advisor. So artistic I, get advisor. To, uh, I get to share my opinions. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we'll jump into that a little bit. Um, she's most recently written a, something called Same Wave, which is an eight-part choral piece commissioned by the Camerata Nova Choir. The Triumph of the Eurochrist, an eight-part choral piece commissioned by the Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, and many, many other comp compositions be before 2020. As I said, she's the Dora Award winner for, for sound design for theater in 2018, Kinelik, These Sharp Tools. Um, she also had a premiere at the TIFF uh, Film Festival. So we don't see Chris just in one genre. And I think that that is both the eclectic nature of that is so exciting, but it's also it's so really, I'm going to ask you about this, Chris, the, the nature of where music is going, I think, with people wearing so many hats. Um, Chris also is very connected with the BAMP Centre for the Arts. Um, she's done the String Quartet residency, but she also, I want to dig in a little bit with you, Chris, on the Indigenous residencies that you that you help to um, curate and run and some of the exploration that's happening there. Chris just returned from Santiago, Chile. Uh, she was just telling me a little bit about that theatre project. Um, but she performs nationally, internationally, she performs solo, she performs with some of Canada's finest other musicians, including Tanya Tagak, Buffy St. Marie, Naomi Klein, and Leanne Simpson, to name a few, and has recently also performed in Hong Kong, Australia, Mongolia, Sweden, and a whole lot of Canada, <laughs> which is the place that Chris refers to as home. Um, Paolo, uh, Pietro Paolo just recently said on The Current, that you know, he's so excited to see this new genre of musician who, who is is taking music in unexpected directions and really creating exciting new things for us to dig into as listeners. And he named Chris as one of those exciting new musicians, and I would wholeheartedly agree. So please, everyone, welcome Chris Dirksen. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I know Nikki is uh, minding the chat for me, and we're going to be about 25 minutes uh, with this wonderful lead up to Chris's residency with us next week. So hello. Are hello. you exhausted? I'm exhausted just from reading that bio, <laughs> <laughs> let alone you living that bio. I want to say that I first met Chris uh, at around the table at the BC Arts Council when mm. we were both on the jury for, um, for large ensembles for the operating funding. And that was near the beginning of my tenure here at the mm. symphony. So it must be about 12 or 13 years ago. It was a bit ago for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
and I and meeting meeting you really opened my eyes and my imagination because of your incredible way of looking at things and your incredible understanding of of the the best approach for taking something as colonial as an or an, 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 an orchestra a symphony orchestra and and learning how to open it up and to be more open to exploration and to find ways of collaboration that are not appropriation and I, mm -hmm. I learned so much from you especially in that beginning time and Chris also introduced me to the Inalpin Center because I was pretty new to the Okanagan and I hadn't heard of it yet and so I've done since then been really privileged to participate in several projects with the Inalpin Center and also with the symphony at the Inalpin Center so so thank you for that <laughs> that was great <laughs> great introductions um so I'd, I'd love to start if you would tell me a little bit about what's happening at the Mount Center. Yeah, totally. So um, it started off with Renalta Arak. She just left. Uh, she was the leader of Indigenous uh, programming at the Bounce Center. And she said, Chris Dirksen, what do you want to do at the Bounce Center? And I work through, all throughout, um, you know, all Indigenous music uh, throughout Canada and a lot in Australia. And I was, I noticed there's a hole, there's something missing. Um, throughout regular like pop music, everyone's really good friends. We all know each other. There's a lot of like interchange of, of ideas and, and conversation, but I noticed that all of my classical peers were all kind of like styloed in their own little boxes you know, composers usually do all by themselves writing alone. And we didn't have that relationship and we didn't have that community. And um, I realized that was a major hole in our in our overall Canadian uh, Indigenous music community. So I brought together uh, 10 folks, um, composers and performers who are all um, varying levels of professionalism, um, but have uh, somewhat of a degree or somewhat of a career within the field. And I brought us together to create uh, a classical music gathering. And really, it was also a lot in response to, you know, we were talking about grants and all the grants that I sit on and you sit on, where we, we see really large projects um, coming through that are Indigenous stories but don't have Indigenous leads um, at the top. So the first year we came together and we did this music sovereignty document. And let me see if I can find it really quick. Um, the music sovereignty document basically says like, it, it talks about how we can collaborate um, in a meaningful way with Indigenous artists. And, and also like, what is, what is Indigenous classical music? And really it all boils down to, you know, if, if the person who's writing it is Indigenous, then therefore it is Indigenous. And it's also kind of, you know, maybe trying to step away from the ever never ending like pan flute idea <laughs> and the never ending like, you know, only four on the floor powwow drum sounds. Um, you know, I, I obviously love power music, but, um, you know, stepping away from that and stepping towards, um, towards like making meaningful relationships between, um, you know, orchestras and um, classical organizations and indigenous performers and, and practitioners of classical music. Which is so great. And there's, of course, the, the, wonderful phrase that can really be um a guiding light which is nothing about us without us yeah exactly uh, which i ask you know when we're ever thinking about what we might be able to do and who we can collaborate that's always the first thing that that i go to and there's incredible artists here in the okanagan um seal artists that we've worked with who i know are excited to come and see your show uh so there's there's been a real joy in discovering what we can do together and um, yeah. i think it's it's such an important and, and when people talk about orchestra you know I, I know it's it's definitely a colonial european um beginning but every 50 years or so you can see how the orchestra has expanded from what it was at the very beginning to including other 
cultures that weren't part of the Austro-German uh, <laughs> mindset at first. And, yeah. and, you know, when the orchestra moved into, into parts in the north and then into the Mediterranean countries and, and then kept, kept moving around the world. And so I think that, that as an entity, an orchestra can be quite exciting because of the number of acoustic performers on stage. I think full stop, regardless of what the instrumentation is, just having that many acoustic performers on stage creates a sound that is, is really beautiful. But I think that's where the definition has to end as far as I'm concerned. Mm. <laughs> I think yeah. that, that, and it doesn't have to be the traditional instruments of the orchestra from that colonial perspective, you know, from that European Western orchestra. I think adding other instruments is very exciting. And I think yeah. that as long as we stay open and respectful and not, um, not to take on someone else's culture without them. But I think yeah. that the, the entity of the orchestra has no boundaries. It can really I, move yeah. in so many different directions. I fully agree. Um, I have a, a project called Orchestral Powwow Project that uh, was my third album um, that is a powwow music uh, surrounded that I composed. These are like already made powwow music songs that I composed symphonic works around. And I got challenged one day as to why I called it orchestral powwow because uh, they they didn't think I had enough at the moment. Uh, I I didn't have woodwinds in it, and they didn't think I had enough players. And I was like, mm, I have like thirty players in this piece. Like that's. To me, that's an orchestra. Like, yeah, the beginning no, of the no, orchestra no. had way less than 30. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. 400 years ago, they were like 20, 18, <laughs> it was an orchestra. I remember yeah. that project because we looked at bringing it here and it just didn't work out that year, but it's still yeah. on the back of my brain. <laughs> it was such an exciting thing to do. It's such a unique thing. Yeah. Um, to do. So tell me a little bit about how you go about braiding your two, um, you know, from your two, your two parents of very, from very different cultures, from the, the Cree culture and from the Mennonite, Mennonite culture. culture. What do you, how do you draw, would you say it's an equal balance? Do you even think about it in that way? Or is it just so much a part of who you are that it just kind of blends? blends yeah, into I mean, I don't really think about, you know, what, I said this once, you can't separate your white blood cells from your red blood cells. <laughs> right. And then of course there was like somebody who like worked in blood, like a doctor of hemoglobin <laughs> in the audience. And he's like, you can. And I was like, <laughs> um, but, but yeah. I, a great image though, I love that. <laughs> um, like for me, it's not, it's not necessarily about separating that. I will have to say, you know, my grandparents on my mom's side, on the white side, they were old colony Mennonites, like old, old, old. So music wasn't really a jam for them. Oh, um, nice. So it's, yeah, they, it was quite painful for my little ears going to their churches. Uh, there'd be like one leader and he'd just choose a tone to start on. <gasps> and then the whole congregation would follow them. But they'd be like microtones and like, Man, yeah, it was not very pleasant as folks followed slowly um, his lines for these like 20 minute songs. Um, so honestly, I, I think like more when I think about, I don't necessarily think about my Mennonite side as like the white training and the white right. classical uh, way that I was brought up to, to do. I started piano when I was five and cello when I was 10 through Edmonton Public String Program. And does, is, that public, does that public string program still exist? Not to the same degree, but there's still a little bit of it for sure. I mean, when I was growing up, I think it was like $300 for the entire year for my single mother to put me, give me a cello and give me group lessons and give me um, string a string orchestra um, experience. And, you know, without public music programs I would not be where I am you, wouldn't have done this. you know I also played cello in my string public program amazing in Ontario. Yeah, yeah I don't think we ever yeah. made that connection but I knew that you were from Edmonton and then there's there's a number of people in our orchestra who knew you from Edmonton yeah I saw some Olivia Walsh of course the cellist and Martine Deadbock and yeah they're, they're yeah. so excited that that uh, you're going to be with us next week so then 
when you were a kid and you were learning cello and you're learning the sort of classical tradition of cello was there always um an experimentation for you to to look at how you blended your your indigenous music heritage in with that classical training or did that come later that definitely came later but I will say like when I was seven and taking like regular piano lessons my piano teacher was like she's not very good and like <laughs> told my mom that maybe I needed to do something else uh and my mom was like she plays piano all the time right sounds okay um and so my mom came to my piano lesson and sure enough I was sight reading whatever little piece was on the was on the the piano and I would be like chord like sight <laughs> note no 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 chord and my mom's like that's not what you've been playing for the last <laughs> Two months. Um, so and what so, you were playing was composing and improvising. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I realized younger that I was, I was definitely more into creating my own music. Right. Um, and so eventually I got myself into university, but I came there with a different mentality than most um, kids. You know, I came there with the mentality that I wanted to learn how to play cello really excellently so I could play my own pieces uh, proficiently. Um. And I didn't take any composition classes. And and that was also a little bit intentional of like not wanting to know the rules, uh, to know if I'm breaking them or following them. I, you know, I didn't want to be influenced by rules of music, quote unquote. Um, So what, what are your biggest influences? I mean, I feel like it's everything around us. Like we can't turn our ears off. So we're, always getting information. Um, To be honest, I don't fully listen to music uh, intentionally anymore, unless I'm writing a piece and I need, I I just finished um, a 30 minute choral piece for Amadeus uh, Choir. Wonderful. So then I started listening to a lot more choral music in the background just to be like, all right, all right, get back into choral. So- Getting that stance, yeah. Yeah, getting the like essence of. I mean, that's what I'm when I when I read your bio, Chris, and talk to you and and listen to your music. I'm really struck by how, the diversity of. Um, it's not just the traditions, but it's the forms. I guess it's not, and not even the forms, but the the groups, the different mm-hmm. kinds of groups that you write for, and the different kinds of art that you write for. So you're writing for film, you're writing for theater, you're writing for straight performance. Um, like just music performance and then within that orchestra small groups <laughs> yeah. solo cello choral and that that that's not that common to have that kind of a diversity of creativity that you're able to move between it's it's super exciting first of all what's it like for you as the composer do you just switch easily or is there is there a genre that you're more comfortable writing in or and one that you have to sort of really think outside your own box a little bit more to get to it really depends on the project uh as to how fast it comes and some projects you know just take a lot longer to ruminate on um than than others so sometimes I can sit down and like bang out you know a 10 minute symphony piece in like a week And then this choral piece kind of took me the whole year. It's about water. It's very intense. Um, And it kind of took me the whole year to like ruminate on it. Um, I definitely will say, I feel like some of the best works are when I stop thinking about what I'm doing and let, let the flow go. Yeah. Um, You get into that subconscious. Yeah. And like kind of that takes the ego out of it. Um, And I think that's when, really good stuff comes out but honestly it depends on project to project person to person um who I'm working with and how excited they are on it and you know there's many different variables so when you're um like a 30 minute piece that's a lot of music there's a lot of music especially Mm -hmm. especially for a straight concert piece so Mm -hmm. do you is your approach to come through it 
from your improvising clearly you've been improvising your whole life <laughs> and thinking about music your whole life so is it is it in that regard? I'm just curious about your your process it might be different for every piece in the same way you're yeah doing. well as you can see my cello is right there and I'm <laughs> always set up to record uh different ideas so uh there's like often a lot of running back and forth between my computer desk and like the Sibelius and the notes on the page and just like plunking around on getting a riff. Um, that happens quite a bit, but also a lot of it is just straight on the straight on the page. Yep. Um, From your head. Yeah. When you're when you're working when you're writing for singers, where do you draw your texts from? It depends. Um I with the, um, the piece I did for AGO, uh it was Triumph of the Eurochrist. And it was like a response to Rubens, um, um, okay. he's an old painter, um, yeah, yeah. and he's got a Triumph of the Eucharist piece. And so uh, I did this piece called Triumph of the Eurochrist, and I used Joshua Whitehead's lyrics about his um, um, murdered grandmother. And Joshua Whitehead is also indigenous. He's a great poet, and he's a great, he won Canada Reads, yeah. um, great author. Uh, so I use his his words, and it was it's a really intense and really hard piece to sing. Um, the words are very, you know, they're all. It's hard something hitting. I do a lot is like using white words um, about indigenous people um, to be like, this is what you did say about us. Um, right. So that piece definitely, I used all of that, and that was really fun and really easy. For this, for the water piece, it's called Mass for Nippy, um, Mass for Water. And that's a little bit of my own, my own poetry, um, a little bit of research, a little bit of, and then I also had some friends write me some things. That's just so to get me great. Going. Eclectic yeah. again. Yeah. Um, tell yeah. us a little bit about your, your works that we're going to be performing next week together. Also they came eclectic. About, these come from the yeah because from different different um, mm. programs you've drawn on totally they they do come from different programs and uh you know uh one piece that's not mine I'm gonna plug is my dear friend Sunny Ray Sunny. Dayrider's piece uh Blackfoot Sunrise uh Sunny Ray Dayrider one he has the best name uh that is a great name <laughs> And he he's in his masters of of com composition at U of Lethbridge. He's Blackfoot. Um, he's a brilliant pianist um, and brilliant composer. And he's this is just a short little snippet of some beauty of of his that we're gonna play. Um, and then we kind of like go to like my album kind of style. Um, so we're doing um, a piece called Buffalo Girls where I'm gonna sing some songs with words with the orchestra. And then we're gonna do this piece called War Cry that actually is one of like the first pieces I think I wrote with Loop Station a long, long time ago. Um, it's an old piece and it is almost on every program that I do. Um, and it definitely is very classic neoclassical but also very indigenous i sing um some some vocables within it i love um, that too i um i heard you play that at folk on the rocks yeah up totally. in yellow knife and, yeah. and um, i remember thinking oh, i wonder if she does this or does this with orchestra yeah <laughs> Does it feel it felt like it had it would it's be a so, big piece you know yeah exactly it big had that kind of grander piece, scale but, yeah, yeah. It's got a lot of drive to it yeah. um, and a lot of sound to it. And then... And what about uh, Overture to the Spider Being? So this is a, a new one. It's um, this one I wrote first for Chamber Fest uh, in Ottawa. Um, and the original uh, orchestration was uh, just strings and a French horn. Um, now we've got some brass in it. Um, and it's called Overture to the Spider Being. Uh, and it's, you know, when I do write pieces, you know, you're constantly doing research and it's a bit of a long story. Okay, so uh, my friend Krista at Chamberfest was like, uh, we're thinking about circles, write something about a circle. And originally I was gonna do something about like 
Dreamcatcher TM and talk about how like Dreamcatchers are mostly made in China now. And um, <laughs> so I was doing that research and then realized that, you know, actually it's just like the Anishinaabe Ojibwe folks that uh, have Dreamcatchers, not Cree folks. Um, but then I was like, oh, thinking about, you know, the web. And I was like, I wonder if there's like spider stories. <laughs> Turns out there's a whole creation spider story uh, from Cree folks where the spider wow. being uh, dropped the two uh, humans down to earth and uh, the the spider was like, okay, I'll let you go down. Cause they were like, oh, it looks greener. The grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Uh, and the spider was like, okay, I'll drop you down to earth but you can't look down and you can't, uh, you can't look at anything. You just, you just have to stay down. And humans being humans, of course, they didn't do that um, <laughs> and got themselves into all sorts of trouble. Uh, so this is the overture. And I just- So is, of, is there an opera coming later? <laughs> it's not an opera, no, no, no. I, I'm gonna do it with a Manitoba Chamber Orchestra. Oh, great. In, in April. So that is definitely what I'm <laughs> fastly working on this Figuring second. out that one as well. We have a couple of our players here, actually, that also fly out and play with Manitoba oh, Chamber. Cool. Yeah, so I'll make sure that uh, I connect you and they'll, be, yeah. they'll, they'll get to play the overture here and then extend into yeah. April and play the rest of the piece. Oh, well, I'm excited to hear that. And I I, I like the idea of like writing a Tarantella, a Cree Tarantella. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I love how um I think just because in the, the the decade that I've known you, Chris, and and you know, we don't see each other often, but as I said, you made such an impact on me. And I, I think that because you're so open to ideas, um, uh, like a Cree Tarantella, I mean, that's just so full of richness and possibility. And I, I think yeah. that that's um just a very inspiring part of your creativity that yeah. is is going to change the world when we have that kind of openness to creativity and and I think that really is an inspiring step forward for all of us um mm -hmm. I don't see any questions in the chat so hopefully I've <laughs> answered all the questions but but would you say a few words about round dance before we yeah. before we let you go yeah round dance is like definitely one of the favorite pieces I've ever written um I'm still in awe of it sometimes. Uh, so I wrote it uh, originally for orchestral powwow, which is something I talked about a little bit earlier, um, where I took already composed uh, powwow music. Um, and I just wanna say that powwow music is a living art. It is not just a traditional thing. There's people making powwow music every day now, and it's uh, very, very famous on TikTok. Um, but, I took orig uh, original poem music and then wrote, composed symphonic works around it. And if you go to my website, uh, you can listen to this piece um, with the singers, but we're just going to do it um, instrumentally. And it's a beautiful piece. Um, it's super, like it's super cinematic and it uh -huh. has a lot of heart and feeling and uh um, you know, round dances are different things to different folks, but uh, their way of bringing people together and you dance together and, and around. And it's also like most commonly accepted now that, you know, it's a way for non-Indigenous folks and Indigenous folks to dance together, um, something that I really love. But also the olden days, it was also a round dance uh, was it was a morning song, like a, a grief song too, and, oh, and respecting yeah. the ancestors and respecting those who have passed. Um, and I think you can hear a little bit of both in, in the piece. So very rich in its history and in its culture, mm -hmm. and in its possibility. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I'm I'm so excited for the show next week. Just really Thank excited you. to have you here in our community, um, to make music with you, to share your music with our our patrons in our community. Chris is gonna be doing a couple of workshops while she's here. She, um, our, our own OSYO Youth Orchestra composing students. We have a comp composition program. Um, yeah. And so we're gonna have Chris work with them, which is super exciting for them. I think that the future of composition, the future of orchestra in your hands with this idea of 
collaboration and openness is so exciting and such a way forward um, that really, you know, will not only change the face of how we make art, but change the way our country can come together and and move through these truths that are being yeah. unearthed and mm -hmm. uh you know towards a reconciliation i'm getting all for clumped <laughs> so i i'm just super excited to have you with us chris and thank you so much for sharing your time today and you're telling us a little bit about your ideas and your your artistry i know she just came back from chile perhaps you could just close the last couple of minutes telling us about that project yeah chile i uh, i got back mm, on monday tuesday i got back on tuesday um it was 5 a.m a little of monday a little of tuesday <laughs> um and so that was with the piece kinalik these sharp tools which is a theater piece that uh i've been performing since 2017 and it's a conversation between the north and south and it has two indigenous folks on stage and two uh non-indigenous folks on stage and they it's really uh, a really honest conversation about, um, you know, what we think of North and South in Canada even, and what is uh, what is recognized and what is forgotten. Um, I'm working with my friend Lakaluk Williamson Bathory, and she won the Sobe Awards uh, to last year, 2020, no, 2021. Um, and she's Inuk. Um, and she flew all the way from Iqaluit down to San Diego. Um, and we were there for a week, setting up the show, doing the show. Uh, and we have a beautiful, powerful conversation in the middle with the audience. And this time we asked, what do you think, uh, what, where is indigenous homelands for you? And we asked folks in Chile that, and it was a really powerful and deep discussion with the audience members. Um, in the middle of the show. Yeah, in the middle that's of the show. That's amazing. Because yeah. so often that's separated and, you know, you do the after show. But you yeah. know, right in the middle of the show and then sort of continue with, with yeah. um, artistic exploration. And that's, that must have been very powerful. Yeah, usually, honestly, usually we ask where, where how far north have you been? But, yeah. you know, we're like below the equator and like, or like or what the north means to you, which is also like a, a dangerous question. Like we ask that in Belfast you know, uh -huh. the north of Ireland, which is a dangerous right. question. Um, we've asked that in like Edinburgh too, which is also like north and south really yeah. have a lot of um, tension. Political tension. Political tension, yeah. Right. And like, you know, I'm in Toronto, like as far south as I can get. Um, in Canada. <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> right. um, but I'm from northern Alberta. And I'm like, where I'm in is like halfway to where, you know, Lac Luke lives and, and how we forget about, you know, this vast land that we have and the people that we have there. And how did the people get there? Hmm. And learning about the relocations of Inuit folk right. up, uh, up north to, if you have folks on the land, you can call it yours. To protect the political boundaries, right? Yeah. 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 It's, so much to learn and so much yeah. to be aware of and uh, thank you for I, I was thinking that this project needs a documentary <laughs> I've been filming it along the way but <laughs> what a cool project for us to all learn yeah. about and yeah. um just super excited to have you in our community Chris thank cool. you so much for giving us your time awesome. today thanks yeah. everyone for joining us please well, do spread you. the word and let's get thank lots you. of bums and seats and uh we'll see you next week yeah see you next week Chris Dixon everyone Thank cool. you. Thank you. Bye.